Welcome everyone. We've got another session here uh, where we're dealing with experts around uh, digital learning and teaching. Fortunate today to have Professor Shane Dawson from Education Futures at the University of South Australia. Shane, good to have you here. Thank you very much, George. So uh, one of the things we usually start with is just a little bit of a background about yourself. You've got a terrific history, both as a researcher, but also as administrator in this digital learning space. So maybe give us a few minutes and walk through the career of Shane Dawson as an academic. Oh, it was one good career move after another. <laughs> I'd stumbled and bumbled my way through. So uh, I started off um, in marine biology, so it's starting to become a little bit more known. So uh, I did research on seagrasses with a, a, a really fantastic uh, group out of the University of Queensland. And I think that was where I started to look at a lot of interdisciplinary work. So post that, I started to get interested in uh, education and particular online learning or digital learning. Back then it was CD-ROMs and Postal. Um, so not exactly online, but we're starting to transition towards that area. I then became interested in learning analytics and then started to do uh, a lot more innovations in that space, particularly social network analysis and ended up running a, uh, a number of teaching innovation centres, uh, one at UBC and uh, one at uh, University of South Australia where I am now, and, uh, and most recently taking on uh, an executive dean role as sort of more into the senior administration of a, of a very large faculty. Well, it sounds, uh, you know, the seagrass to uh, dean of executive dean, it's, it's not exactly a direct pathway on most career charts that I've seen, but I think the one part that is interesting about the work that you are doing and that you have done is that there are a lot of developmental aspects to beginning to teach with technology and, and recently in the, your previous role is leading a teaching innovation unit. These are the kinds of units that are central in many organizations, teaching and learning centers or whatever uh, they're called in different institutions. But they're, they're critical and this is a time and an era unlike any other. I mean, has there ever been a time where a system that helps faculty teach and move curriculum online or at least add a technology component been more relevant than it is right now? Absolutely not. It's actually, um, you know, I think it really highlights the need for support units like that. So I think one of the dangers of, of, of uh, centralized units and every centralized unit will go through this uh, pendulum <clears throat> of uh, you know where they're doing teaching support where they're centralized controlled by by uh, you know to service a whole range of needs then they get dispersed they're too expensive so we'll disperse them into areas of pockets that need and then they sort of break out and they're doing their own innovations it becomes sort of unruly they try and gather them back in and become centralized again so this pendulum approach uh, is there. I think at the moment, it, it's on one hand very disappointing in that we're in a space now where we are scrambling because you know, you've had a large group of people who were doing really good innovations and, and had trouble scaling those innovations. The flip side is it's a, a, it's a wake up realization of the importance of, of support structures like this and how they can actually impact and galvanize a whole institution relatively quickly and support them through a very, very difficult process. And so from your experience uh, previously uh, leading that as a unit, but also as a researcher, what have you found is most important for educators to be aware of, for faculty to be aware of as they enter into online or even blended teaching? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll take two arms. So one is that uh, I never liked the notion of teaching support. So I'll, I'll kill that one off now. It's always about the scholarship, right? So you've got a group of people who should be specialist researchers in the scholarship of teaching and learning, whether that's online, assessment, academic integrity, you know, the whole range, the whole gamut. So to provide leading support and leading edge work that brings along a, a, a whole institution. So in that space, I think, you know, the groups that I've led is to refocus what constitutes research in that. And so from that, you can ask, actually start to ask questions around what is important. So I think for the, for the teaching support process or that teaching support units as they're traditionally known, it is to do research. You should be at the front and it's redefining what is research there. And for me, it was always, you know, if you're gonna recommend a, a computer, that's desktop research, right? If you're gonna recommend a particular microphone so that people can have good recordings, I don't care whether you're a professional staff or an academic, you do desktop research and you read reviews and you find out what's gonna be the best process. 
So the whole thing around empirical research has to be done by these groups. And when you do that, you are bringing in a group, which means the, the whole process of what becomes important for an institution becomes very contextualized. And so I think for me, it's always been around feedback for students, feedback loops, and having the learner at the center, which is not gonna be a strange for any of the conversations you've already had in that process. I know there's been lots around uh, sort of elements of design. I think communication is the most critical part. If you, could, you can stuff up every aspect of your teaching, but as long as you've got good communication and a good connection with your students, you can always come back and address that. So I think the most critical component at the moment in terms of research is generation of that community, solid social networks where peers are helping one another and excellent communication and feedback. That was a great point because especially the, the process of developing courses can take weeks and months if it's done properly. But even then when you're teaching, it's still critical that you have those interactions with your students and that you're connected with, uh, with their experiences and able to adjust and adapt to what they're doing. When you move online urgently, then it, those social connections become even more important than when you don't have uh, the ability to develop in support systems through your design process. Now, uh, one thing before we start talking about your current experiences, uh, you know, as a leader, but what you've been a tool builder, if you will. I mean, you've developed tools like Snap, social networks adapting pedagogical practice. You developed a video annotation tool called Oval. Uh, you and uh, another colleague, Abelardo Pardo, developed the on-task adaptive feedback system, and so on. What have you found about the technologies that people use? Like what makes it effective when you design tools or when you incorporate technologies into the teaching practices? What kinds of things should faculty be aware of? Yeah, again, it's a, it's a, that's a tough question, right? So it's always been about timing. Now, out of all three, I would have said Snap was the, was the best tool. I, it was the most fun, to be honest. And Anisha Bakaria uh, out of UQ now, uh, she, she's the, the developer of that. She's brilliant. Um, so I think I, for me, I was just lucky to have great people around me to, to sort of formulate ideas and, and play around with these sorts of things. But I think Snap was, I think, one of the best tools, but also one of the most underutilized. And the idea of Snap was that people would be able to go in and see the community structures building and through discussion forum activity. And people tended to use it as a reflection tool at the end, right? So they, you know, the teachers there you work with, and even though you could hit that button every 20 seconds if you wanted and, and see whether, you know, there's a, a new node in your network or whatever else, people looked at it at the end and said, eh, that wasn't really what I wanted. And so how, do you, how did you get people up front? And so I think that was really the, the driving critical elements of other other aspects right is how do you build in innovations where people are being more proactively using them and feeding back so when we approached uh, on task that was different uh, that was that was a a tool there to provide immediate feedback based at the front so you had to restart thinking about your planning and your teaching right at the front snap well i think was 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 an awesome tool tended to be used at the back end and it wasn't that reflective process so i think when you're building innovations it's really where uh, where in the system do they have the most impact? And I think that's where a lot of the leadership and work that we've done more recently in rolling out innovations across institutions, or even just looking at change in pedagogical practices or the adoption of you know, more digital learning within, within the system, where do you have the most impact? And if you can identify that first off, then you can bring the right group of people in to start to, to forge that process. And so it is, a significant change when you get a, a, enough of a population following. Important points around the, the need for people to understand what the tools are for and what they actually enable beyond just the thing. So the example you started with with Snap is mm. great, it gives you these networks and these structures, but really the opportunity is a self-reflection tool. When you begin to, which is a key aspect of any kind of analytics or learning analytics work is, what can it help you do to improve your practice of teaching? So if you get feedback that says you don't have these, you know, you have these very isolated clusters, how can you word your discussion forum activities differently? How can you structure the kinds of things you want students to do based on the input you're getting? Or if you get feedback in terms of how students annotate sections of videos or how they, uh, you know, respond to nudging through a feedback system like OnTask, it's the tool itself 
isn't the end game. The end game is lifting your teaching practice, improving the quality of your performance and interaction with students. And these technologies are there to surface and support it. And I think we always risk fetishizing a tool and becoming, you know, making the tool the thing, but it never really is. So yeah, yeah. that's an excellent point. Sorry, I, I just type in. I mean, you look at the, the process now with dashboards and how we're struggling with dashboards, whether they're student facing in terms of learning analytics dashboards, right? So looking at sort of engage, engagement metrics and so on, they're, they're, they're blanket, right? So you, you make them very generic. So, but it doesn't take into the context of why, why people have designed in a particular way. And so I think that's where you're right, that the design element of on task, which requires you, you're trying to generate feedback loops based on a behavior that students have undertaken or a pathway in a, in a learning design process, which means you have to think about that learning design process at the front. And it allows you then to also build in elements that are important to you as a teacher, but may not be significantly important in terms of academic performance. So, you know, the generation of community might be a great outcome, but, and that's com completed through, through discussion forum activity, but that doesn't necessarily mean posting on a discussion forum will ultimately lead to uh, an improved academic performance. Um, <clears throat> but it's still important to an instructor, so therefore you build, you build in those rules and that feedback processes. So I think that's, that's an important element is that, that design component and consideration. And when we look at dashboards at the moment, it's always sense making right you need to make better sense of the tool but it doesn't actually build in the design and the context of what you're trying to achieve to allow you to make sense of the tool so that translation from information to to sensible action is we have we haven't bridged that yet i haven't seen anything yet that really closes that gap yeah uh, important uh, to to recognize that you know the limitations of the tools or limitations of the technology as you're identifying what it does well and what needs to be developed going forward and i think given where we're at right now with this huge rushed technology tools for teaching, I think we can reasonably expect two things to happen with the technology providers. One, there'll be greater integration across a range of tool sets and platforms, mm -hmm. and we'll start to see some hubbing of tools. So Microsoft Teams is just the first mm -hmm. illustration of something that integrates what used to be separate discrete tools. But secondly, I also think we're gonna to start to see a lot of new opportunities coming in or new startups coming in, which is distractionary and also time consuming in a lot of cases, because now you've got this discrete tool that you have to learn or that one that you have to learn. So there will, as more people use it, there are more dollars flowing into the space from a venture capital end, which means there are a greater number of people wanting to play and build tools and solve problems. Um, last question, just to keep this conversation uh, reasonably uh, brief, is you've now taken on a new role. You're an executive dean of Education Futures. Your mandate is to ensure that society in South Australia does not collapse. What kinds of things do you worry about now, or what kinds of things are front and center in your role currently to ensure that you're helping to develop future leaders in classrooms around the world to be able to use technology meaningfully? Oh, that's a toughie. I think there's lots of things that keep me awake at the moment. Two small children trying to be homeschooled would be, <laughs> would be one. Um, it, it's, I think you described uh, earlier in some of your talks about the, the two hump problem. I think you just like camels, really. Um, I don't think so. But the, the first part, you're right. I think you described as we're all in a life raft and eventually we're going to dock and want to build a better ship. And I think at the moment, it is very much for the teaching profession. They are in that life raft. And as much as we can in the education futures with, through pre-service teacher training, is provide additional support to the profession. That's, that's the number one, right? Let's get through the crisis we have at the moment so that people have got a little bit of breathing space. We can look and monitor their well-being and uh, make sure that we come out, the, uh, you know, out of this in the best position as possible and recognise where our shortcomings are and what we can do in the longer term to start to address it. I mean, for, for education futures, it is very much, uh, and you've been a strong advocate of the notion that you know, a relationship with a university or, or learning in particular is no longer short term. You don't finish a university degree and you pop off and that's the end, you hang up boots. It's just really the starting of our learning journey. And so I think having that recognition and, and being able to do further research and development and support of elements of workplace learning and learning for life 
is, is an important aspect we need to, and in that, um, the areas around how we actually start to work with technologies, you know, the, the increase of artificial intelligence in classrooms or even just basic machine learning processes or recommender engines that uh, students sit on every day, right? Netflix generating a, a movie for you to watch or your kids, you know, they, they need to understand what are the assumptions that, you know, all these recommendations and suggestions made by an artificial agent are actually, what are they based on? And for teachers, that's critical because every time you hand over an app or a tool or anything there where you're trying to develop digital literacy skills in a classroom, you're handing over agency. And we need to make sure that our teaching profession in particular is aware of that, that power play between the two elements of artificial and human. That needs to be critical there too. How does it address disadvantage, social inclusion and equity? There's a whole range of areas there that we need to be very mindful of and continue to do work on. And I think it's a great way on which to, to end it because there are, uh, I, I expect, like I said, there'll be a, a flood of new tools and new technologies. And we've had this before in the joyous days of Web 2.0, for those of you that were actually involved at that time. But, you know, it was literally, awesome. oh, it, was the, it was the Cambrian period. It was, it was glory. But, you know, what, what ended up happening there is we, we were chasing technologies. And if somebody had a new tool, we chased it. There was no principles on which we made those decisions. And I think you're exactly right. And, and I think with your background in building technologies, that starts to become very important is what are the things that you want this technology to do to make the learning experience better? Not, is it cool? Did the right salesperson show up to try and promote it or pitch this or sell this? Did the district buy this kind of tool now we all have to use it? I think a principled approach to selecting and using technology is going to be critical because we're at a turning point here. There, there's nothing in, when we come back from this situation, and by back, I mean into classrooms, whether we end up going fully physical teaching again in the, in the next 12 months or not is uncertain. But what is clear is that when we do go back, there will be an expanded role of digital technologies in almost all classrooms because teachers will have developed capabilities, students will have developed expectations. And so as a result of that, having a principled approach to understanding how and why you use technology is, is important. I'd extend that just before you wrap up as well, George. It's not just in the classroom, it's going to be in the workplace as well. And how we, we interact across all, all facets. So. Yeah, and it's really about knowledge building, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't matter where you are, whether you are a student in a primary or a secondary system, whether you are a university student, or whether you're in the workforce, or, or a big population that's now being addressed by both universities and, and other startups is the, uh, you know, sort of the senior citizen or retired population and the way that they engage. So it really is a cycle of lifelong learning. Even today, I was reading about, you know, an NFL quarterback, which is the National Football League out of the United States of America, not some kind of rugby activity such as in Australia. Um, it's, you know, when the quarterback is like what they're doing, him and his partner who are quarantined is they're taking MOOCs and they're learning online. And it's, it's, that's what we do these days. We're, we're a learning culture, a learning society, and learning resources are increasingly accessible. So good point. It's beyond classrooms. It's a life approach. Thanks again, Shane, for taking the time to chat. Appreciate your time. Pleasure. No, no. Glad to see you.